This is Corey with Black Box Hobby, and thank you for choosing to listen to the Vintage Baseball Card Podcast, where everything old is new again. Today we're going to discuss the 1887 Old Judge set, also known as N172. If you end up liking this episode and would like to show some support while also showing your love for the hobby, please visit our store at tpublic.com to see our baseball card themed shirts, hoodies, masks, magnets, and more. I'll have a link in the show notes, but the URL is tpublic.com slash user slash blackboxhobby. You can also follow us on Twitter at blackboxhobby. On to 1887 Old Judge. Issued across multiple sets from 1887 to 1890, the Goodwin Company's Old Judge Baseball Card Series includes hundreds of 19th century baseball players from over 40 major and minor league teams as well as boxers and wrestlers to a much lesser degree. The cards measure approximately 1 and 7 16th inch by 2 and a half inches and depict photographs from the Hall Studio in New York that were pasted onto a thick slab of cardboard. The backs are blank and the fronts are sepia-toned images with Goodwin Company New York printed at the base. However, the set doesn't exactly have a uniform design Some cards have names handwritten on them, others have the Old Judge Cigarettes brand name in various shapes, sizes, and appearing on different parts of the card. The set would eventually be assigned the designation N172 in the American Card Catalog by Jefferson Burdick, which we profiled in our very first episode. While the N172 issue wasn't the first baseball card series, It represents perhaps better than any other set, including the N28 Allen and Ginter set, the early days of baseball cards, and even hints at the days to come with multiple variations of players and rare short prints. It's a beautiful look into the early days of both photography and our national pastime. The set features portraits, full-length standing poses, and what can only be described as cutting-edge studio shots that show a fielder or batter in preparation to catch or hit a visible baseball, which is obviously being suspended by a string from the ceiling. Taking these action shots one step further, Old Judge also featured the multiplayer card, where two players share a staged action scene and also features managers, umpires, and even a few team mascots. While the T206 set has a special place in many vintage collectors' hearts and is affectionately known as the Monster due to the sheer volume of card variations, the Old Judge N172 set is also monstrous in terms of numbers. Because the cards were not numbered and no official checklist was created, it may never be known the true extent of the set. But what we do know is that more than 500 different players have been documented and when factoring in variations in pose, team associations, photo cropping, and spellings, the documented total of unique cards exceeds 3,000 designs. And that number may be as high as 4,500 according to PSA. Many of the game's early stars and eventual Hall of Famers are presented in this set and often carry the most premium to purchase. They are Cap Anson, Jake Beckley, Dan Brothers, John Clarkson, Charles Comiskey, Roger Connor, Ed Delahanty, Hugh Duffy, Buck Ewing, Pud Galvin, Clark Griffith, Billy Hamilton, Ned Hanlon, Tim Keefe, King Kelly, Connie Mack, Tommy McCarthy, Bid McPhee, Kid Nichols, Hank O'Day, Jim O'Rourke, Old Hoss Radborn, Wilbert Robinson, Amos Rusi, Sam Thompson, John Ward, Mickey Welch, Deacon White, and Harry Wright. A non-Hall of Famer who is highly collectible is future evangelist Billy Sunday, a center fielder for the Chicago White Stockings and the Pittsburgh Alleghenies. Another card featuring player Art Whitney is rather popular among collectors because of who he shares the card with, a canine mascot. The old judge has many obscure and scarce card nuances which give many collectors a thrill to find. Through the ongoing process of cataloging and online sharing, new rarities are still being occasionally discovered. While old judge cards themselves aren't particularly rare, collectors looking for individual players or specific variations can often have a difficult time. 
Some specific variations that some collectors covet include the Browns Champions cards, which feature 13 players from the 1886 St. Louis Browns, along with the harder to find Spotted Tie cards, which feature players from the 1887 New York Metropolitans wearing the same spotted tie. Also prized by many are the very tough to find California League players, which were likely limited in distribution to the sparsely populated West Coast. The biggest problem with the Old Judge cards today is the fading issue many have. A quick eBay search for Old Judge will reveal just how bad many of these cards have faded over the last 130 plus years. This gives cards that have sharp, crisp images a premium on the market. Due to the card's sensitivity to light, it is highly recommended these cards be stored out of light, which make it difficult to display them. Rebacking is another common problem known in this release. Reback cards are cards that have had the original backs removed and then pasted the photography to a new back. One reason a card might be rebacked is that many of these old judge cards would have been glued into scrapbooks. And when removed, the backs of those cards are often damaged, so some collectors have been known to remove the old back and attach a new back to the card. However, grading companies obviously consider this an altered card, which diminishes its value compared to an original, unaltered counterpart. With each set discussion, I choose five cards to highlight. These aren't necessarily the most five expensive or desirable cards. They are just simply the five cards that I find the most interesting the most compelling to me as a collector. Number five on the list for the Old Judge in 172 cards is Kid Nichols. The youngest pitcher to amass 300 wins, Kid Nichols was said to have never been replaced by a reliever. Later in life, he partnered with Joe Tinker in a movie distribution business and was an accomplished bowler. Playing for the Omaha Omahogs, which has to be one of the greatest team names of all time, he has five card variations. In my favorite, he is posing while holding his right arm out in front of him with a baseball gripped in his hand in the mock motion of pitching the ball. With a rather eye-catching uniform, the jersey has vertical white and dark stripes, which makes the Omaha lettering across his chest a little difficult to read. It's a cool image of one of baseball's earliest great pitchers. Number four on my list is Dan Brothers. Recognized as the first great slugger in baseball history, his 519 slugging percentage was tops all time until eclipsed by Ty Cobb, and his 342 career batting average still ranks ninth all time. At 6 foot 2 and 207 pounds, he was genuinely large for the era. After his playing career was over, his former teammate and manager, John McGraw, put him in charge of the gates at the Polo Grounds, and he remained with the New York Giants for over 20 years. He has at least five card variations in the set across two teams, the Boston Bean Eaters and the Detroit Wolverines. In the image I find most appealing, Brothers is donning black pants contrasted with a white cap, shirt, and high socks. He's a bit awkwardly posed with bat in hand to hit a ball that is suspended on a string that is meant to invoke a pitch coming across the strike zone. Number three on my list is Charles Comiskey. Charles Comiskey, who would forever be known as the founding owner of the Chicago White Sox, an eventual namesake of their stadium, was also an accomplished player of the 19th century who was the captain of the 1886 St. Louis Browns. Before his team and reputation as an owner was tarnished due to the 1919 Black Sox scandal, he started his career as a pitcher, later moving to first base, before transitioning into a successful player manager for several teams and then eventually founding the Chicago White Sox. He has many variations of cards in the set, including one of the Browns Champions subset that we discussed, but in my favorite, he's shown lying on the ground with his arm outstretched and hand resting on a bag. It would appear it could be him mock sliding headfirst into third or possibly mock diving back to first on a pickoff play. The details in the photo are rather vague other than the distinguishing striped ball cap. It's one of the earliest cards for a man whose name is still rather prominent in the game today. Number two on my list is Connie Mack. Cornelius McGillicuddy, great name, 
entered the league in 1886 at age 24 and remained a near permanent fixture in the league until he retired from managing the A's in 1950 at the age of 87. His tall, thin frame gives him a rather unique, lanky look for a ball player. Nicknamed Slats because of his tall, thin frame, his physique is on full display on all four variations of his card while playing for the Washington Nationals. In my favorite variation, he's a catcher, notably without any equipment as customary for the time, and he's squatting behind home plate while closely eyeing a ball as it passes over home plate. His hands are resting on his knees instead of being placed in front of him ready to catch the ball, which somewhat kills the attempted realism of the staged action shot. Nonetheless, it's a very cool image of an iconic baseball lifer who, like Comiskey, played, managed, and even owned a team. And number one on my list is Adrian Cap Anson. We touched on Cap Anson in our Allen and Ginter episode, and I'm trying to do my best not to repeat players too often. But in this case, Anson's cards in both sets are unmistakably very iconic cards. So in case you missed a bit of the info about Anson in the Allen and Ginter episode, I'll kind of recap. Anson played a record 27 consecutive seasons and is regarded as one of the game's first superstars. Anson, who had prolific numbers on the field, is almost as well known historically for his influence on the racial segregation in baseball that persisted until Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947. There are reports that on several occasions he refused to take the field if there was a black player on the opponent's team. He was an early innovator of adopting a spring training in a warm climate to get ready for the upcoming season. He was also known to gamble on baseball games in a manner eerily similar to Pete Rose a century later. He would also tour on the vaudeville circuit, but many of his business ventures, such as ginger beer, which literally exploded on store shelves, would fail, which led him to bankruptcy later in life. The legendary Cap Anson appears on two different cards, with the uniform version being the rarer of the two. In fact, it's so rare that only a handful exist, and not many collectors have ever seen one in person. While all of the cards in the set are technically pretty rare, the Cap Anson uniform card is the most desirable one in the entire release. He is shown from the stomach up, his arms crossed just below his chest, where the HICAG in Chicago is still visible in white lettering across the dark uniform. With no cap on his head, his distinctive mustache dominates the image and gives hint at his strong persona. Anson has a second card in the set that features him in a suit and tie. That is the more common card of the two, and while it also is one of the most desirable cards in the set, his card picturing him in his Chicago baseball uniform is a true rarity. This card is extremely rare. Only four currently exist on the PSA pop report, and the lowest of grades would likely fetch high five figures. In conclusion, these cards feature some of the earliest known photographs of some of the game's earliest stars. I dare say most vintage collectors would say at least one old judge card is a must-have for any collection. Many of the various poses displayed also reflect the changes in the game that have taken place over the last 130 plus years. From fielding positions, to batting stances, to bat grips, to uniform styles, one can get lost in viewing the multiple variations, studying the traits of the ball players, and admiring the skill of the photographer. Like the Allen and Ginter set, they represent the beginnings of an ever-evolving game. While some of the most desirable cards from this set are affordable to only those collectors with the deepest pockets, some of the more common or lesser-known players from the set are relatively affordable. For a few hundred dollars, a vintage collector can add to their set an example of this truly iconic set that helped establish the hobby as we know it today. These cards, which were inserted into cigarette packs beginning in the year 1887, the same year gunfighter and dentist Doc Holliday died and shoeless Joe Jackson was born, are really like holding a piece of history in your hand. Yes, baseball history, but also American history. And that officially wraps up our look at the 1887 Old Judge in 172 set. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Vintage Baseball Card Podcast. 
I hope you'll stick around for the release of our next episode when we take a look at the granddaddy of them all, the monster, the T206 set. Again, if you like this podcast and would like to show some support while also showing your love for the hobby, please visit our store at tpublic.com to see our baseball card-themed shirts, hoodies, masks, magnets, and more. I'll have a link in the show notes. Until next time, remember, everything old is new again. Happy collecting.